All right. So I hope everyone can hear me well. I hope everyone's doing well. I'm uh, Michael DeSandro, pediatric urologist at UCSF. Um, no disclosures. And um, this is um, not going to be anything too deep. It's kind of like embryology um, 101 for pediatric urology. So we're not going to delve into kind of deep details, but we're going to try and cover all the basics um, so we have a good general idea of the embryology and how it relates to clinical problems that we see. Um, so if you like congenital anomalies in embryology, uh, you're going to love pediatric urology because if you take into account um, the urinary system and the genital uh, system and the amount of congenital anomalies associated with those uh, outweighs anything else. So there's more pediatric urology congenital anomalies than uh, the next closest by far, such as musculoskeletal or heart. So we're in a very um, embryologic uh, field. So it's, it's important to understand the embryology. So we're going to hit uh, on a bunch of things. Um, like I said, this is all kind of uh, basic stuff and how it applies to some clinical uh, situations. But uh, we're going to uh, first talk about the pronephros, mesonephros, and metanephros in renal development um, and some of the abnormalities that can occur with the abnormalities here. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, the metanephric um, uh, duct and where it inserts into the cloaca and the new bladder and some of the abnormalities that can occur here. And then finally, we're going to talk about some of the internal and external uh, genital organs <coughs> and how they relate uh, to all that. So basic structures that um, you need to understand first is the pro pronephros, uh, which pretty much goes away relatively early on. Um, and the more important structures are the mesonephros and the metanephros. So the mesonephros is associated with this mesonephric duct, right? And this duct comes down and uh, drains into the cloaca uh, during embryonic development. Um, it also creates this little ureteric bud, which is eventually going to be the ureter coming from the metanephros. So the metanephros is uh, uh, the final kidney after it develops, and the mesonephros is only important later on because of the residual mesonephric duct. So um, we're going to talk about how important the ureteral bud is here and how important this mesonephric duct is uh, embryologically. So um, the ureteric bud, as we saw in that last um, image, attaches or kind of hits the metanephros and forms a kidney. Um, this is just mesenchyme initially, uh, and the kidney doesn't develop until the ureteral bud hits it. So the ureteral bud has to hit the kidney, and then you get these mesenchyme epithelial interactions that form, and then form a, a nice normal kidney. If this ureteric bud has trouble reaching, the, I don't know if it's reaching or has trouble hitting uh, the, meta, uh, the mesonephros, or if there is no ureteric bud or there is no uh, a mesonephric duct, you're not going to have kidney development. You just can't because the only way the kidney can develop is with this ureteral bud um, mesenchyme interaction. Um, the ureteral bud can hit the kidney, but it can hit it um, in abnormal ways. So if it doesn't, um, if the ureteral mesenchymal interaction isn't kind of right in the right place uh, in the kidney, in the metanephros, it's not going to develop correctly. So if it hits it a little too high, and we're going to talk about that later with ectopic ureters and stuff, but if it hits it a little too high or it hits it a little too low, you're going to get a, a bit of a dysplastic kidney depending where it hits it. Also, it, they have to hit, but they also have to communicate with each other. So the mesenchymal uh, epithelial interaction and the molecules in, uh, that cause that um, need to be uh, working well in order to get uh, kidney development. So there's a couple things that can go wrong with the ureteric bud or with the metanephros. Um, as I mentioned, if the ureteric bud doesn't hit the metanephros, you're going to get renal agenesis. The kidney just can't form. 
um, the urinal blood can hit the uh, metanephros, but if there's ab abnormal contact, you're going to get some form of the dysplastic kidney. Now, uh, interestingly, um, these signaling molecules are super important, and you need these mes-epi interactions um, in order, like we mentioned before, in order for the kidney to develop correctly. Um, here's an example. These, there's more than this, but these are good examples. PAX2 is a good one because it, it causes the renal coloboma syndrome, which is autosomal dominant, and you have these uh, unusual malformation of the optic nerve, renal anomalies, and reflux. So um, the gene that um, affects mesonephros um, mes epi interactions is not working correctly, and you get these abnormalities. So here's an example of a um, CT scan, uh, axial view right through the, where the kidneys would be. And you can see here, this is a, a normal kidney, nice uptake, but contralateral, you don't see anything. So this is an example of just renal agenesis where either the ureteric bud didn't hit the metanephros or there was no ureteric bud or, or mesonephros. Um, this is another example. Here we have, you can see a pathology specimen of a very cystic kidney. Um, and the problem here is that um, you can see the ureter is abnormal. When the ureter hits the mesonephros, there's, a, there's an issue. It's, it's not developing correctly. Um, and this is an example on ultrasound. You can see here these, uh, this is most likely a multi-cystic dysplastic kidney because you can see these big, large cysts and none of them are communicating with each other. Um, so it's not like a blown out hydronephrosis. It's not like autosomal recessive kidney disease, like cystic disease where you have little tiny cysts. Uh, these are pretty obviously non-communicating cysts, which is a multi-cystic dysplastic kidney. Um, these multi-cystic dysplastic kidneys interestingly associated with other anomalies, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, and musculoskeletal. Um, but um, GU is kind of, uh, um, uh, more interesting because um, of the metanephros, I'm sorry, the mesonephric duct abnormality. So the way you look at a multi-cystic dysplastic kidney, or the way I remember it is that the, the mesonephric duct proximally, where it's forming the um, ureteral bud and hitting the kidney is causing cystic disease uh, proximally, and then distally the mesonephric duct where it becomes the seminal vesicles and where it becomes Gardner's duct in a female uh, is also not forming uh, um, at the interactions correctly, and they get cysts down there as well. So there's cysts at both ends of the mesonephric duct. So that's, uh, dis that's uh, dysplastic kidneys and renal agenesis, um, but we also need to talk about mesonephric duct failure. So there is no mesonephric duct. That obviously is going to lead to renal agenesis, like I, I said before. There's going to be no ipsilateral ureter because there's going to be no ureteric bud. You're going to have a hemitrigone, and I'll show you a picture of that because the mesonephric duct is important in the development of the bladder trigone. And since you get, um, since the mesonephric duct becomes the vas deferens and the seminal vesicles, you're not going to have those develop correctly. So here's a schematic of a mesonephric duct uh, early on to late on em em embryologically. And you can see that it, when it hits what's going to become the bladder, um, it forms the trigone here, and then here's the ureteral bud coming out. So if you don't have a mesonephric duct, you're not going to have these structures. This way is going down towards the testicle. So this would be like the um, vas deferens and seminal vesicles, and this way would be down towards the epididymis. And you're not going to have a trigone here, so you're going to have a hemitrigone. So you're only going to have this half of the trigone develop. Um, so it's, it, it's interesting when uh, there is no mesodephric mesonephric duct development. Um, so that's missing it all together, but more likely is you're going to have ureteric bud misplacement um, on where the ureteric bud is coming off of the uh, mesonephric duct. And that's going to lead to vesicoureteral reflux or an ectopic ureter, kind of the two main things. Um, you can have a duplication. You can have two um, ureteral buds coming off the mesonephric duct. Um, and that leads to a duplicated collecting system and sometimes associated with reflux and ectopic ureter as well. So, but first we're going to talk about the single system um, ureter. So uh, 
this is a kind of a simplistic schematic I like to use. Um, it's not probably how it really happens in real life, um, but this is a good way of remembering it. So the mesonephric duct is coming down here, uh, hitting like we showed in that earlier picture, hitting what's going to the cloaca, but what's going to become the bladder, and it's going to form the trigone this way. So the mesonephric duct is we're going to form the trigone here. And it's going to go this way down here too to form like the seminal vesicles in, in that direction or if it's a female gardener's duct. Um, and then the ureteric butt is coming off that same structure that's going to uh, form the trigone and form the distal structure. So normally this isn't a mesonephric duct with three different ureters. This is just showing where the three possibilities are. <clears throat> so Possibility A is the ureter comes out a little too distal in the mesonephric duct. Possibility B is where it normally comes out, and C is where it's coming out too proximal in the duct. So you can see B, if it hits the metanephros right in the middle, you're going to get good, this is B down here, you're going to get good kidney development. Um, the kidney is going to develop nicely, uh, and the ureter, B swinging around up here, is going to end up right here in the trigone where it normally is with a nice tunnel so you're not going to have reflux. So everything turned out good in that case. If the ureter comes off too distally, it's going to be, it's going to hit the metanephros in the wrong place. So you're more likely to have renal dysplasia. And then this ureter is going to end up going way too far and you're not going to have a good tunnel and you're going to have reflux. And the opposites here, if it's more proximal, you're going to have a little dysplasia because it's hitting the metanephros in the wrong place but it's not going to go far enough into the trigone, so you're going to have an ectopic ureter. And it can even go down this direction, right? So you can have um, the ureter, if it's really proximal, it can end up attached to like the vagina in the where the Gartner's uh, duct would be, uh, and then the urine can drain in directly into the vagina, or it can go into the bladder neck uh, area as well, or in a boy, theoretically, into the seminal vesicles as well. So that's a single system. Um, and here's an example of what an, a dilated ectopic ureter would look like. Um, and here's an example of, of a ureter entering uh, the vaginal uh, area in a female, and they would have constant urinary leakage with that because there's uh, no sphincter. Uh, this is a single system ectopic ureter in a boy entering um, right at the bladder neck. Uh, so kind of the internal sphincter area. It can never go, in a boy, it can never go past the external sphincter um, because embryologically, uh, that's uh, the mesonephric duct never goes past that uh, point. The farthest it goes is, is the seminal vesicle, so. All right, so that was a single system. And now you have, you could have a duplicated system, right? So you could have two ureteric buds coming off the metanephric duct. Um, again, B would be the normal position, so it would hit the metanephros kind of in a good position, and you'd have a nice uh, development of a kidney associated with that ureter. But this one's coming off a little too high, and it's hitting the metanephros a little too high, and so you're getting some dysplasia here, um, and you're having uh, that ureter be more likely to be ectopic because of what we talked about before. It's going to end up down here somewhere. So the reason it's the Weigert-Meyer rule is because intuitively you would think that the upper portion of the kidney would drain to the upper part of the bladder and the lower portion of the kidney would drain to the lower part, but it doesn't. It's the opposite because of the way this flips around and goes up. Um, so normally it's the lower pole um, that uh, goes to the upper lateral part. And that usually, if there's an abnormality, usually would have reflux, not obstruction and the upper moiety goes down to where it would be ectopic um, and, and dysplastic that direction too. So it kind of flips. That, that's it, you know, it's not always abnormal. Most of the time duplicated ureters are actually normal. You know, you can have a Y type duplication with two normal kidneys up here. They can be duplicated all the way down to the bladder and all, maybe just a little bit of dysplasia or relatively normal kidneys. So not all duplications are associated with abnormalities, but um, they can be, and we don't usually see them until they are because usually you don't run into a problem with a duplicated collecting system unless um, you have an ectopic ureter or high-grade reflux or something like that. And that's what this case uh, is showing. So here's an ultrasound 
um, of a duplicated system. And this is the lower moiety right here. Um, and the lower moiety has some hydronephrosis in it. Um, and that's, you're gonna guess what that's from because of the Weigert-Meyer rule. You're gonna guess that's from reflux, um, not obstruction. Lower, lower moiety refluxes, upper moiety obstructs. Um, and here's a big, uh, most likely ectopic ureter here with some dysplastic tissue around it um, with the duplicated system. Um, it can, there's other reasons you can get this too, right? Like ureter seals or other ureteral abnormalities, but we're just gonna keep it simple. Um, uh, so the embryology uh, lesson stays simple. I'm not gonna talk about the other things too much. Um, other things that can happen to the kidneys are uh, problems with ascent. Right, so normally the kidneys start out down low um, and then as they move up, they get new blood vessel, new vascular supply, um, and they end up being just below the adrenals. The adrenals are always in, up here. They're not ascending as well. The kidneys kind of go up and meet them. You can have problems with ascent, uh, such as if you had like a pancake kidney and with a pancake kidney, these vessels get in the way, inferior mesenteric artery, so they, they kind of get stuck down here, that and a horseshoe kidney and they don't go very high. Um, and so you can have ectopic or pelvic kidneys because of that. Um, here is an example of a um, horseshoe kidney. And this is an old IVP, but they show them the best, I think. So you can see the isthmus here where they're kind of connected. And then the whole shape of it is kind of going like that. And then the other thing with horseshoe kidneys you see is that these um, calyces are aiming at us. So it's their anterior displaced. Um, normally when the kidney moves up, it rotates uh, lateral as it moves up. So these calyces normally would be facing laterally, but since it never got a chance to rotate, since it's stuck down here, they're still, they're still facing anteriorly. So that's always a clue when you see um, calyces facing towards you, either on a VC, usually not on an IVP anymore, but um, on a VCUG, let's say. All right. So now moving on to the other aspect, we already discussed um, all the kidney and mesonephric duct up here, but now we're gonna talk about a little bit about um, the cloaca uh, uh, and how that develops and the problems that can happen with that. So the two main things you have to remember about cloaca uh, are that there's a cloacal membrane and then there's a urorectal septum. So the urorectal septum is gonna come down here. This is the schematic from this view, and here it is right here. And it's gonna separate the hindgut here uh, from the bladder and your, I guess, your genital system. Um, so this comes down and separates them. This is before it does that, and this is also before it does that. In the meantime, there's this cloacal membrane that's kind of sitting here, and you can see it here, that's kind of holding everything back um, before the, um, abdominal wall develops, and that's important when we start talking about um, extrophy. So you can see here this urorectal septum coming in, it's separating these uh, two structures, the rectum and the urogenital uh, um, sinus area, and then when it comes in they're completely separated and you have two separate holes externally. Um, also important is this area here which is where the cloacal membrane would be. Um, and this turns into um, uh, abdominal musculature, which holds everything in before the cloacal membrane ruptures. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. When it ruptures is important. So you can have problems associated with all that. You can have a, what's called a persistent cloaca. Um, which is where the cloacal membrane is fine, uh, ruptures when it's supposed to, but the urorectal septum doesn't form, it doesn't push through correctly and doesn't separate everything out. Um, you can also have the ep extrophy epispadius complex, uh, which is where the cloacal membrane is not, uh, ruptures a bit too early and is, isn't normal. Um, in that case, you can have uh, either bladder extrophy, cloacal extrophy, or epispadias, depending on when the cloacal membrane actually ruptures. Um, if the cloacal membrane stays intact, but the urorectal septum isn't forming uh, correctly, um, you can get other types of anomalies other than pushing in cloaca. You can get just rectourethral fistulas, rectal vesicle fistulas, kind of little variations of everything, common urogenital science, which I'll show you a picture of later. 
So here's a persistent cloaca, kind of a, what you see classically in a female. Um, so normally, right, the urogenital sinus uh, is going to come through here and separate these two. So you'll have a separate rectum and a separate um, urogenital uh, area here. But in this case, it didn't, and it's all connected. So there's only one opening, um, and that everything is connected, the rectum, the vagina, and the um, bladder. So that's, you know, that's a cloacal anomaly. That's where the um, cloacal membrane stays normal. So cloacal, cloacal anomaly is different than extrophy. Um, with extrophy, you're having uh, an issue with the cloacal membrane. It's rupturing uh, in the wrong time. So here you can picture, imagine it's not drawn here, but imagine this is the cloacal membrane running up here while everything is developing. This is early on, and this is a little bit later. Um, what happens is this mesoderm develops and that becomes the abdominal wall. And then once the abdominal wall forms, it's okay for the cloacal membrane to rupture because everything's kind of held in. Um, so if the cloacal membrane and abdominal wall, wall all work uh, in concert like they're supposed to, um, you'll have the only opening in the cloaca coming down here, which is where everything is going to come out normally. If um, it ruptures, the cloacal membrane ruptures a little too early before the uh, mes mesoderm separates, before you have abdominal musculature, the bladder is going to come out through the skin, which is bladder extrophy. <clears throat> if it's somewhere in between uh, and just a, some of the mesenchyme, sorry, some of the mes mesoderm develops and you have mostly a good abdominal wall, but just a little bit missing here in the cloacal membrane ruptures a little down here, you're going to get epispadias. Um, if the cloacal membrane ruptures really early while this is still connected before the urorectal septum comes through, you're going to have cloacal anomaly. Uh, sorry, you're going to have cloacal extrophy because uh, everything's going to be open, um, and that luckily is much rarer. So this is the typical bladder extrophy. You can see the penis with the epispadius here and a, a big open bladder um, with the lack of abdominal musculature here. And this is where the abdominal musculature develops relatively well, holding the bladder in. But down here, the cloaca membrane ruptured a little early, um, and so you see just epispadia. So it's all on a, on a that's why it's a, on a spectrum. Here's another, this isn't extrophy, but this is another type of cloacal anomaly. Um, it's a uh, rectourethral fistula. And this would be common, let's say, in a boy uh, who has an imperfect anus. So the, um, uh, the, uh, Urorectal septum stops here, doesn't come all the way through, there's no uh, rectum development, so you get this little fistula down here. Similar to a full cloacal anomaly in a girl, except there's no um, vagina, so it's not a true cloacal anomaly. All right, so that's cloaca, move on um, to genital development. We'll talk about internal genital and external genital development. But you can see they're all kind of interrelated with the mesonephros and paramesonephric ducts, which we talked about earlier. Um, it's the germ cells that are going to be important uh, to determine what's happening uh, as time goes on. So you want to start by understanding what undifferentiated uh, gonads would look like. So this is the undifferentiated state early on at six weeks. So you have an undifferentiated gonad here. The um, purple is the meso uh, uh, nephric duct, and the blue would be the malarian duct. And then you know you have them both before uh, uh, differentiation occurs. And you have to remember they're each going to have their subsequent um, adult um, analog. So. This is the gubernaculum, which eventually would become the round ligament. Um, the, uter the ovary or testes is going to be the, this undifferentiated gonad. Depending on what happens here, you're going to have malarian regression or malarian development. Um, and then this yellow down here is a different color because it's the urogenital sinus, and that's kind of a different uh, embryology. Um, but they all kind of connect down here. 
So what happens is if you have testicles, the Leydig cells start to make testosterone around eight weeks, um, a, and they also begin to make malaria inhibitory substance. Um, if it's a ovary, you won't have any testosterone, um, and you won't have any MIS. Um, so you start to get male and female differentiation. The genital tubercle, uh, which would become the clitoris, uh, female, and the penis in a male, begins to lengthen at around nine weeks. And the genital swellings, or labioscrotal folds, which become either labia or scrotum, begin to enlarge as well. Um, and then later on is when the urethra slowly becomes a urethra, um, and then the mesonephric and paramesic mesonephric ducts are completely uh, differentiated. So um, we're kind of skipping a few weeks embryologically going from what we saw initially, the undifferentiated state to the completely differentiated state. Um, and you can see what happens um, with, with ovaries and you can see what happens with testes. Um, so if you have an ovary, um, you're not going to have any malarian inhibitory substance, so your malarian structures are going to develop normally. So you're going to have a uterus and a proximal uh, one-third of the vagina. The distal one-third is part of this urogenital um, sinus and not part of the malarian duct. Um, and then um, you're going to get regression of this mesonephric duct, with the exception of a little um, Gartner duct down here, which is in the proximal portion, the proximal uh, two-thirds of the vagina. Um, and that's important because that can sometimes lead to cysts uh, that can become painful or, or need to be dealt with. Um, but that's a remnant of the mesonephric duct, which is involuting in a, in a female. In a male, you're going to have testosterone and you're going to have this malaria inhibitory substance. So the malaria structures are going to involute. Um, and what you're going to be left with in a male, as far as malarian structures, are uh, the ten, appendix testes up here, and then part of the, um, the utricle, prostatic utricle down here. Um, the mesonephric structures are going to stay intact. They're not going to involute like in the female. Uh, so you're going to get seminal vesicle development, uh, vas deferens, um, and all that good stuff that the mesonephric duct becomes. Um, the uh, genital ridge is a uh, separate, sorry, the, uh, sorry, the genital tubercle uh, develops separately um, than uh, what we were just talking about. So this needs to be discussed kind of a, a different plane. Um, but again, we'll start with the undifferentiated state. Um, you have the genital uh, tubercle here, which is going to become the penis or the clitoris. <clears throat> you have these uh, genital folds and then your periurethral folds. These genital uh, folds are going to become um, labia scrotum and the inner folds are going to become labia minora or part of penis foreskin. Um, you can see here in a female that the, um, uh, sorry, this is the male, that the Urethra slowly zips up with time by about 14 weeks. The whole meatus is at the end, and this is all zipped up. And the uh, folds, I'm sorry, the swellings become scrotum here. And then the um, periurethral folds become the um, anterior foreskin. And in a female, it's different, no testosterone. So um, the labial uh, swellings become the labia majora, the periurethral folds become the labia minora. This common urogenital sinus by 14 weeks eventually uh, separates into two, so the urethra and the vagina are now separate uh, as they come through. Um, and you have get a little mons here developing as well. So it's good to, you don't really have to memorize this because it's all embryology that we just talked about, but kind of to sum it up, um, these are the adult equivalents uh, of embryonic structures that we were talking about. So you have either a testes or an ovary, it's testes column, ovary column. Uh, cortex and medulla would be the seminiferous tubules and the reedy testes or the ovarian follicles and the reedy ovary. Um, and then the gubernaculum, like we saw, is going to stay the gubernaculum and a 
male and turn into the, and in a female, it'll be the ovarian a round ligament, the ovarian ligament on top and a round ligament on the bottom. Um, mesonephric tubules uh, aren't super important, but the mesonephric duct uh, is. So the mesonephric duct becoming the epididymis, the vas, the ejaculatory duct, seminal vesicles, the appendix epididymis, like we saw in the picture. And in a female, they're becoming the Gartner's duct uh, down by the vagina um, and the oophron duct and appendix ves vesiculosa. vesiculosa. Um, Gartner's duct is really the most important of these three. Um, the malarian duct becomes the appendix testes uh, in a male and female, it's uterus, fallopian tube, and remember we said the proximal third of the vagina, the distal quarter or third will be uh, your genital sinus. Um, and so the urogenital sinus is the bladder, urethra, distal portion of the vagina, um, and periurethral and vestibular glands. And in the boy, um, it's the urethra, prostate, Cowper's glands, part of the prostatic utricle, and urethral glands. Um, the, obviously, the phallus becomes a penis or a clitoris. And the urogenital folds uh, becomes the ventral portion of the penile foreskin, or the labia minora. And the labial scrotal, scrotal spines become the scrotum or the labia majora. You can have all kinds of um, abnormalities happening um, with this timeline. Um, these, some things as common as undescended testes or as uncommon as um, ovo testes and some stuff in between two um, happening with the gonads. Uh, the vagina, vagina or uterus might not develop correctly or could be bifid. Um, or obstructed. Uh, the in external genitalia uh, can have all kinds of problems too, which we see all the time. Uh, labial fusion, clitoral hypertrophy, like in uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, epispadius, which you saw pictures of, periurethral cysts, um, or all these male uh, conditions, which are super common in pediatric urology. Um, <clears throat> VSD is its own talk in itself, but um, is very uh, is very embryologic, especially in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, because of the testosterone. Um, you're uh, not getting normal development of the urogenital sinus. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, but you can also have things like androgen insensitivity syndrome, which is affecting external genitalia development. Persistent malarian duct syndrome, which is the MIS we were talking about earlier, malarian inhibitory substance. If it's if you have a testes um, that doesn't have MIS, you're going to have um, a male uh, with um, a genetic male with a uterus and a proximal vagina because uh, the MIS it, it was not there. Um, syndromes too, like Myra Kotinsky, uh, that is kind of the opposite of this persistent malarian duct syndrome. Um, it would be a um, genetic female who has MIS when she's not supposed to. So their malarian structure is involute. So they're missing a uterus and a proximal vagina and all they have is the distal one third or one quarter of the vagina. Um, and then we get some other syndromes too um, uh, that can affect um, external development and also internal um, like uh, Dennis Drash, um, where you have gonadal dysgenesis, Wilms tumors, um, so they can kind of all intermingle. Um, so this is an example of what I was talking about, the common urogenital sinus. Um, it's not really a cloacal anomaly, right, because here's the hindgut and the urorectal septum is coming through and separating this urogenital sinus from the hindgut but it's all the same embryology, so you can kind of think of it as one. Um, but what happens in a common urogenital sinus, let's say with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, is that this, uh, this area is being influenced by testosterone. So it's thinking it wants to become more like male external genitalia, a penis with a urethra that zips up like we showed you a picture of. Um, and this, um, and what happens is the vagina stops here as if it was a remnant of the malarian structures like in a boy, which would be like the prostatic utricle. So it's not making it all the way down 
Um, and when you look in, this is with looking in with cystoscope, you're looking through a common sinus, which is the common urogenital sinus, you'll see the vagina and uh, the bladder. The vagina is going down, the bladder is going up, um, and that's a common urogenital sinus. If you have normal hormonal milieu, then you're going to get this normal development where you have a, a, a normal introitus or a vestibule, and you're going to see uh, the urethra above and the vagina below um, um, nicely separated. Oops. Um, some other things that um, can even little things can be associated with embryologic problems, such as a patent processes vaginalis. So here's the testicle starting up in the abdomen, descending down through the processes vaginalis, ending up down in the scrotum. If you if this processes vaginalis stays patent, fluid's going to go back and forth, peritoneal fluid, and you're going to get a hydrocele. Uh, eventually, that processes vaginalis could close, um, and the hydrocele could go away. Um, in little babies, but in older kids, that's not going to happen. You could have um, descent of the testes in the wrong position. So the testes might not come down at all, be undescended. It could be high in the abdomen, an inguinal canal, or down towards the scrotum, or it can be all these weird types of ectopic uh, testes as well, um, um, including femoral ones, which actually do occur. Um, so I think that's basically all the basics we're going to talk about. Um, if you want to ask any questions, feel free. Um, otherwise, thanks. All right, so um, thanks everybody and um, whoops. Oh, there is a question here. Actually, I would say the, um, the best, that question was what's a good book to read about all this? Um, I would start with Campbell's. I mean, all those good pictures, a lot of the pictures I showed you, the color, color pictures are, um, uh, are really good. Um, so I would start with that. There's a lot of good stuff online too. If you want to watch videos about how, how it develops, um, you can look at YouTube videos too. Okay, very good. So thank you everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening.